started crying and that makes it really hard to sing. This is a new one. Um, we were going to bring it in this week because it was going to tie in with Pastor Karen's message. Uh, Pastor Karen's not preaching anymore because she's got the COVIDs. Um, but I really felt to, to keep doing this one rather than change the songs and wait until the message was coming in because I think it's really important leading into Easter to just reflect on these things. Um, and if it makes you cry, then all good, because I probably will too. So just, I just encourage you to just really press into this space and just, just, um, just welcome whatever it is that God wants to do in your heart this morning. Crimson robes draped over the ashes A wide open tomb where there should be a casket The children are singing and dancing and laughing The Father is welcoming, this is our homecoming Roses in bloom pushed up from the embers Rivers of fear flow from good times remembered Families are singing and dancing and laughing. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Heaven joins in with a glorious sound. And the great crowd of witnesses all gather round. Because the ones that were lost love finally found. The Father is welcoming. This is our Coming scarlet sin had a crimson coast. You nailed my debt to that old rugged cross. An empty slate at the empty grave. Thank God that stone was 
people involved in kids both had their 33rd birthday on, on this weekend. That was amazing. That was said for my benefit later on. It's quite a procedure this, isn't it? Missing someone, I think. Does anyone have a word they would like to sit in the chair? <laughs> well, I'm going to pick someone. Uh, Sam Cogger. Good on you, Sam. You can't wait till next time I'm preaching. It could be you. <laughs> yes, uh, Pastor Karen was supposed to uh, speak, uh, but. Uh, COVID going through the house uh, and we're going to be uh, sharing a little bit uh, around the communion table and uh, we hope it will be a blessing uh, to you. I'm going to be speaking on the section of scripture from Luke chapter 22 verses 14 to 18. So I'll just read them. There's no uh, slides, I'm sorry, this week. So, okay, Luke 22. 
when the hour had come, he sat down, Jesus sat down with and the 12 disciples with him. And then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this, divide it amongst yourselves. For I say, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. I'm going to look at uh, two sections there. The first is the one that says, Jesus himself saying, with a fervent desire, I have desired. And I thought to myself, what's this fervent? And the actual um, definition of fervent is a passionate intensity. Now, Jesus sitting down with his boys, they'd been together for three years. They had had at least two other Passovers to share and they had had every meal, breakfast, lunch, dinner, they had shared together over those three years. But here he is, Jesus said with great emotional intensity, I have passionately desired to have this meal with you guys, with these friends, with his disciples. I thought what could develop that, such, uh, that emotion when Jesus knew what was coming after this, this, the Last Supper? How could this emotion be in Jesus? And I, I had some thoughts how Jesus could be moved in such an intense way to seek just to have this meal with his friends. The first of them was this. This meal represented a dynamic change in the spiritual nature of the world. Before this, the nation of Israel had lived by the law, right up until Calvary, right up until, let's say, this point. It was the law, it was going to change. It, up until this point, it would have been the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all these religious individuals acting as a conduit by which the individual, the person, the ordinary Israeli, could reach out to God. They had to go through this very strict system. But now there was going to be a change where every person, every person could react to God, could reach out to God, could communicate with God on their own and in their own way, in their own words, by their own heart's desire. This was going to be a change. But I think the most significant thing was that he was having the meal, this last supper, with his friends. With the people that he loved, with the people that loved him. And can I say, whether this may be the first time you partake of communion, we'll be having a little bit of juice, a little bit of biscuit in a short time. It may be your first time. Can I say to you that Jesus says to you, I have passionately desired to share this meal with you. And if you have had this meal, if you have had communion a hundred times, two hundred times, whatever it may be, I can assure you that Jesus is saying exactly the same thing. I have passionately desired to be with you this morning while we share this meal. Because it is a signifying thing. It is a representative thing of relationship. These 12 uh, disciples, the apostles, 11 of them, one of course would betray him, but 11 of, the, of them would form the basis, the foundation, the nucleus of the next step in Christianity. They were going to be the ones on whom Jesus was going to lay the burden of, spread, of spreading his word, of showing his love, of exhibiting his power. It was these 11 souls, these 11 men, who initially had the responsibility to take the words of Christ, 
the witness of Christ, the evidence of Christ out into a culture, into cultures that were antagonistic unto the point of death against the things of Christ. It was these 11 men sat there, perhaps not fully knowing, but had surrendered their lives to Christ. They were going to be the ones. And friends, it is the same today. His people, you. His people, you. His people, you. Are the ones he is there. He has come into this place, even into this place, and says to you, I passionately desire to have this, for you to take these emblems as a sign, as a sign of your love for me and for the strength of our relationship that we share and for the hopes that I have in you. It is that passion that brought Christ into that table. We he knew what was going to be happening in the days and hours to come, but he sat with his friends, his boys, his loved ones, yeah. and said, this I have desired. I have passionately desired this moment in time. We can be together for the last time in this way, but this will open the door to a magnificent future. It will open the door to a future full of purpose, full of plan, full of love, full of hope that you will take into this world. He established this group. He set aside this group amongst all the other people that were following him. There were this 11 people. He had great plans for them. He has the same for you. He has the same for me. He has that same emotional response. As we stood, as we sang, as our hearts were surrendered to him again and again and again. Perhaps a tear did come. Perhaps your hearts were lifted. Perhaps during the past week you have had some problems. You have had to face an issue. So many things can happen. But here we are, seated together with the Spirit of God, being God's representative on earth. He is here with us as we partake of this today. Jesus said, I have passionately desired this moment in time with you. As Beck said, just take a moment. Take a moment. Realise that it is this moment that Jesus has said to you, I want to spend it with you. I don't want to share your mind. I don't want to share your thinking with what's happening today or tomorrow through the rest of the week. I want to take this moment. I gave myself for this moment. I have established our relationship for this moment. Please take this moment. Please take this time as we move into communion very shortly, as you're holding this jar, this, sorry, cup, as you're holding this biscuit, take that moment. Take it seriously. Take it significantly. Take it with all responsibility and know, and know that God has this moment for you. God's attention is on you. God's focus, God's mind, God's eye is on you. Take it and recognise the relationship that it represents, the relationship that he desires. Take it knowing that whatever, however you tripped up, however things went last through the last seven days, whatever, God is here for you today. He desires to meet with you, to spend that short time with you. Please do so with great seriousness, with great honour, with great focus. And know that that is being returned to you a hundred times over as Jesus, the Spirit of God, sits with you.
Pastor Sam is going to share with us now some of his thoughts on communion as well. God bless you, Sam. Can we give a round of applause to Pastor Gary? That was brilliant. I was actually, I was so excited when I got told that um, I got the honour of actually preaching with Pastor Gary. I've always, you know, I never actually thought I could be up here with him, um, but here we are. So I'm going to attempt to continue to broaden our scope of um, what communion is, and I think it's, it's beautiful how how you've just um, shown and illustrated to us how Jesus would, would give that to the disciples as an invitation to them, but also to us in this moment. And it really, it prioritizes it for me. It, it draws it um, power for that context for me as well. Um, but when I think of communion, there's something else that, that comes to mind immediately, and that is probably the act of remembrance and the way that uh, communion is this way that we get to remember God. And I love that Jesus gave us a physical act that we could do to help remember things. Because I don't know about you, but I really struggle to remember things in my day-to-day life. We all know that life is busy and and chaotic. And and let's be honest, in putting this in context, if you invited me out to coffee, um, say next week, I would probably forget. I would love to because coffee is my weakness, but I would probably forget because it's just up here. So what I do is I write it out on my phone. I I write it out in my journal. I put it in my calendar. I have a physical act to try and remember it because otherwise it becomes kind of distant and foggy. And what Jesus has done and what I love about communion is that there is a physical act of remembrance. It's not, he's not just saying, I'll just remember this and read this in the Bible once and remember. He's like, no, there's this physical act that is symbolic of my sacrifice. And just like baptism is symbolic of the way that we die to our old life and rise again as children of God, so is communion symbolic of the way that Jesus died for us. And I absolutely love that. And when Jesus is talking about communion and he talks about his sacrifice, uh, and in John 6 verse 54 to 56, uh, Jesus is talking to the crowds and his disciples and he says, but anyone who eats my flesh, oh, PG-13 warning, okay. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise that person at the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. And at the time that statement was a little confusing because without context, you're like, wait, what, what does this mean without context? But with context, Jesus is saying that it is by his body that we get salvation. It is by the sacrifice that he went on the cross to make that we actually get to have relationship with God, that that we actually can become children of God. And so he... He was being symbolic, but he was also being, you know, quite, quite relational in this context because it's by his perfect and sinless body getting broken on the cross that we actually get to have a relationship with Jesus. It's by his blood being poured out as he died on Easter Friday. It's by that that we actually have our sins covered uh, and by his blood that we are healed, by his stripes, we actually can encounter God. And so when he says, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, he is laying out a way so that we can experience salvation. He is showing us the way to life. He is sharing that it is only through him that we can have relationship with God and eternal life. And so it's not really just enough to admit that God exists. I don't think it's enough on Easter just to just be like, yeah, I know Jesus died. We could do that. But there's also this physical act of remembrance where we get to say, you know what, this is the way, the truth and the life. My Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And when I take that cup and I take that bread, that is symbolic of the sacrifice that he made. That is symbolic of the way that he went on a cross for me uh, because he chose me and he's here for you today. Just like Pastor Gary said, that he is here inviting you today. And when we take it, we get the opportunity to remember why it is so significant. And so we have to, in the words of Jesus, it says, whoever eats my flesh and blood has eternal life. Another way of saying that is that whoever acknowledges that the only way to salvation, the only way to eternity, the only way to true freedom and purpose in this life is through Jesus. That is what gives eternal life. And through his life and ministry, um, we would see that Jesus would actually point to this illustration of food. 
which, and drink, because in today's life, we know that food and drink sustains us. Uh, food and drink keeps us alive. And obviously we know that because I figured out we got cake at the end of the service. So I'm really excited for this. And, and obviously, you know, I'm, a, I'm in love with coffee. It's like my fifth love of the world. So there's like, there's food and drink that can sustain me, but it can only do so temporarily. It can only do so temporarily. And even then I will eventually die. Even if I have as much food and drink as I want, I will eventually stop breathing. But Jesus is saying that even with food and drink, which is temporary, there is a spiritual food and a spiritual drink that he can provide, which gives spiritual life. So when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he is actually also saying that by taking his bread, by taking the drink that he supplied to us, we can actually experience this life. And so it makes sense then in John 6 verse 35, he says that I am the bread of life that whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty again. And he is saying that he is the gateway to eternal life. He is the gateway to satisfaction, to freedom, to peace and, and joy, because he is actually the only one that can speak to us in a way that we need to be spoken to. In a world that is constantly offering me everything, but delivering nothing, Delivering nothing that really sustains me long term. Nothing that really gives me true joy or vision or purpose. In a world that offers everything but gives nothing, Jesus offers his life for us. Jesus went on a cross to die so that I could have life here and life in the future. And Jesus did that so that I could experience relationship with God. And so when we take the cup and we take the bread, it is that symbolism where we're like, this is the only way. Jesus is the only way for me. He is my true creator. He is my God, my Lord. And so communion is remembrance. It's remembering, no, this is why I'm here. This is who I believe in. This is the, the one thing, Jesus, that will sustain me forever. And so... Communion is a reminder of the love life that Jesus laid down and the life that he offers us. But it's also an invitation. And I think, Pastor Gary, you spoke on this so brilliantly. Obviously, the Holy Spirit was in our message today. But communion is as much a reminder to us of our God who laid down his life for us as it is an invitation. I'm actually going to get the team to maybe start sharing the, um, the communion around as I keep talking about this. You know, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 16, it actually, it kind of poses this question to us. It says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? And so when we take communion, we actually have this invitation it's not mandatory. It's not something you have to do. It is an invitation to participate in the community of believers and the shared faith that our Jesus is Lord and our Jesus died for us so that we could have life. And much like Jesus laid down his life for us, when we take communion, we have this invitation to lay down our life for him. Because I have my own desires. <laughs> And I have my own dreams and I, I, I know what I want. But communion is that opportunity to recognise that my Lord and Saviour laid down his life for me when I was at my worst. And if he saw me at my worst and would still die for me, then I'm going to lay down my dreams and desires because I know he wants the best for me. And so communion is an invitation to reflect, an invitation to maybe just let go Again, let go of what we've been carrying this week. Let go of maybe the sin that so easily entangles, the distractions that have been going on, the fear and anxiety that, that you know, perpetrates our, our society today as we, we see people, you know, go into isolation constantly. But it's also an invitation to join in the community of believers. You know, it's an invitation to join with faith with those around us knowing that Christ died for you, but that Christ died for the person sitting next to you. And when we take communion, you're not doing it alone. Jesus had communion with 
all of his disciples. It says later in the book of Acts that they would gather together regularly and feed and drink together in memory of Jesus. And so when you take communion, it is an invitation into the best community and family that you could ever have. Not just the ones sitting here in this room, but those that are sitting in other churches around Tassie right now and the world right now, and even past and present, Christians that have chosen to lay it all down and take up communion, recognising that Jesus is Lord. It is that shared belief that we get the absolute blessing and honour to be a part of. I'm not taking this by myself. I'm not doing this on my own. No, I am standing with my brothers and sisters and I am choosing to believe that in all things Christ reigns, that in all things he is the way, the truth and the life. That in all things, if he died for me, he's gonna keep living for me. That if he actually went up on that cross and, and bore my shame and my guilt and my sin, then he has the best plan for me. I'm cool letting it go because I'm doing it with my family. I'm doing it together and I'm doing it focused on him. And so we recognize that Romans 6 verse 23, and I, and I thank you, Sam, so much for that song. I love that you continue to go into it because it sums this up so well. It says in Romans 6 verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so we're going to go into a time of communion right now. And we're going to take a few minutes just to sit and reflect, to remember why it is significant, to remember again the sacrifice that our Jesus made for us, for those around us, for those that we know are hurting in this world and struggling in this world and far from him, that he would die for every single one of us that the cup represents his blood that was poured out on the cross, that, his that the bread represents the body that was broken so that we could actually have life, a life we don't deserve, but a life that was given to us. It's an invitation to remember, to reflect, and even to refocus and be like, no, this is why I believe. This is who I believe in. He would die for me, and then he chose me to live. He has invited me to live, and not alone, but together. So, Pastor Gary, would you pray for us as we go into communion? Thank you, Lord. Lord, we just take this moment to remember you, to remember your words, to remember those miracles amazing amazing miracles but to remember you also as the silent lamb of god who gave his life gave his life so that we might experience a new life gave his life that we might experience a new relationship with you father that gave his life that we might have hope we thank you lord that we can gather around together and share this small, significant, but significant moment with you. We thank you for this little jar, cup of juice. We thank you, Lord, that it represents your blood, blood that was shared, Lord, not through any guilt of your own, but through our guilt, that your blood was shared for the forgiveness of sin. We thank you, Lord that we can take this little piece of biscuit representing a body, your body, that was broken for us, for our emotional, for our physical, for our intellectual, for all of our healing needs, oh God. We thank you for that body that was broken for us. I thank you for the body that was broken by me, for me, for me, oh God. Friends, take, the, take your biscuit now. Eat your biscuit, drink your juice in the time that you would like to do so, remembering that Christ is here with you in the midst of this meal. And all of our friends online as well, just take a moment to get a some 
form of juice or whatever, a piece of biscuit, and if you could join with us, it would be a great honour on our behalf for you to do so. Thank you. I wonder, as we finish, as you partake of the juice and the biscuit, if you would like to begin to thank God, just quietly in your own way, in your own words, to thank him for this beautiful relationship, to thank him for your salvation, to thank him that he is here with you and walking with you every day, every moment. Just take a moment just to thank him, either quietly or just in a very low voice, just saying, thank you, our Father, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, my Lord, my Saviour. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you, O oh God. Oh, we thank you, our Father. Thank you, O oh God. Oh, we praise you, God. You are a great God. You are a mighty God. Oh, Lord, our Saviour. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you, O oh God. take this moment, this few moments, just to worship God and allow the Spirit of God to speak into the, your heart as you do so.
and woes Death came to life When he called me by name Scarlet sins had a crimson coast You nailed my death to that old rugged cross and at the empty grave, thank God that stone was rolled. Scarlet sins had a crimson cost. You nailed my death to that old rugged cross. An empty slave at the empty grave. was my eight-year-old daughter. And as that line came up, she knew that there was a possibility that none of us had it, but she did. She sat on the ground crying because in her little mind, it meant that no one could come near her, that she was infected, that she was sick, that she had something that no one wanted. And so she thought she had to do it by herself. And in that moment, Chris and I, we got down on the floor with her and we held her and we loved her. And we told her that she was never alone and no matter how sick she had, no matter what contagious illness she had, that we would always be there and we would always hold her, even if it meant that we got sick too. And as I sat there on the floor with her, I felt the Holy Spirit say, this is where Jesus is. This is what Jesus died for so that He could get down into your messiness, so that He could get down into the parts where you think that nobody wants to be, no one wants to go. That He's not scared of a little bit of sickness. He's not scared of a little bit of dirt. He's not scared of a lot of dirt. That He wants to get down on the floor with you and put His arms around you and tell you that He's going to be with you every step of the way, that no matter how hard this journey gets, no matter what the sacrifice is, that He is going to be there with you every step of the way. That's what the cross is about. He knew that we were separated from a God who loved us. And so He was prepared to do the hardest thing he was prepared to hang on a cross for us so that we could walk in that freedom, so that we could be free. He did it so He could come down and He could sit in the dirt with us and say, I am going to meet you exactly where you are but I died on the cross so you don't have to stay here. When I take communion, that's what I remember. When I take communion, I remember what He forgave me for. When I take communion, it gives me the courage and the boldness to forgive the people who have hurt me. 
When I take communion, it gives me the courage and the boldness to believe every promise that the Bible says. When I take communion, it gives me what I need to speak the truth. To align myself with what God says about me and to step away from the things that the enemy is trying to tell me. Today, you have all had an opportunity to take communion here. But I want to encourage you is communion isn't just for church. Communion is something you can do every day. Communion is something that we need to do every day in times like this. We need to take moments out of our day to remember. To remember what He did for us, remember what He bought for us. So we can step away from the lie and into the truth, so we can realign ourselves because so often we feel like God's moved away from us, but it's not God, it's us. And communion helps us remember what He's done so we can step back in to alignment with what He says for us. And so I want to encourage you to take what you did today into your Mondays and Tuesdays and every day of the week. That as we go into this Easter season, don't just let it be about chocolate and family as as amazing as it is, but let's remember. Let's remember. The enemy wants us to think that it's just an event. The enemy wants us to not realise how powerful it actually is. He wants us to forget. He wants to preoccupy our minds with everything that we need to do so we don't actually take the time to remember because He knows that when we remember, He knows that when we remember what He has done for us, that we remember the power that He has given us and then we're gonna step into the truth and everything that God has got for our lives. And so we're gonna close this service and we've got great coffee and great cake But just for a couple more minutes, we're gonna sing. And we're gonna let the words of Pastor Gary and Sam and the team and the songs and we're gonna let them sit. And for a while longer, we're gonna remember. So that when we walk out these doors today, it's in the forefront of our mind what Jesus did for us. And so no matter what our Mondays and Tuesdays and every other day has for us, we can remember that He's got us. So the team are gonna sing and then Sam will close. But let's just take these last two minutes to remember what He's done for us. Because He wants to meet you in the dirt today. See bright crimson robes draped over the ashes A white rope and tomb where there should be a casket The children are singing and dancing and laughing The Father is welcoming, this is our homecoming Roses in bloom push up from the embers Rivers of tears flow from good times remembered. Families are singing and dancing and laughing. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Heaven joins in with a glorious sound. And the great crowd of witnesses all gather around. Cause the ones that were lost are finally found The Father is welcoming, this is our homecoming Scarlet sins had a crimson coast You never mind get to that old rugged cross An empty slave at the empty grave Thank God that stone was rolled Scarlet sins had a crimson coast. You nailed my dead to that old rugged cross. An empty slate had the
the empty grave Thank God that stone was rolled away What an awesome morning, eh? What an awesome word. Thanks so much, Sam and Gary, for what you've brought and for Beck for the way you've led the service. Why don't you stick around and have some cake? I went out and had a look at the cake, and I, it's massive. So enjoy. Enjoy some fellowship with your friends and say hello to someone you haven't met yet. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. <laughs>